in you as well. And in his blog refers to her as the central boss. She was the boss of the entire house, and he warned other people not to upset his mother, for she will be vindictive for years. John said in his blog that his sister was more of a victim than anything else, and was very controlling of her adult children, John's niece and nephew. Unfortunately, the only other information we have about John's family is what he said in his blog, and none of the information he does share with the world says anything good about them. After the shooting, John's family did release a statement saying that their hearts went out to the victims, and they apologized for their son's actions. John also explained in his writings his confusion as to why he couldn't get a date or a girlfriend. He stated that he dressed well and was clean-shaven, along with a steady career, yet he was still unable to find love. December 29th, 2008. Just got back from tanning. Been doing this for a while. No gym today. My elbow is sore again. I actually look good. I dress good. I'm clean-shaven, bathed, touch of cologne. Yet there are million women reject me over an 18 or 25-year period. That is how I see it. 30 million is my rough guesstimate of how many desirable single women there are. A man needs a woman for confidence. He gets a boost on the job, career, with other men and everywhere else when he knows inside he has someone to spend the night with and who is also a friend. This type of life I see is a closed world with me specifically and totally excluded. Every other guy does this successfully to a degree. Flying solo for many years is a destroyer. Yet many people say I am easy to get along with, etc. Looking back, I owe nothing to desirable females who ask for anything except for basic courtesy, usually. Looking back over everything, what bothers me most is the inability to work towards whatever change I choose. John's YouTube channel is still accessible on YouTube. There are only two videos that he uploaded. One of the videos is him standing in front of a camera, giving a motivational speech of sorts, telling people how he could hide from emotion. It is easy for me to hide from my emotions for one more day. Take a long drive in the car, listen to some music, daydream, or just do some mundane task around the house that really doesn't need to be done, that's, that's not too important. And there you go, one more day. And one more day turns into one more year. Now, um, RDS says that I have approximately maybe 15 more years to be successful at this. And when I heard that, I wanted to continue immediately to, to start moving on this. I didn't realize I had that much time. So my objective is to be real and to learn to be emotional and to, you know, to be able to emotionally connect with people. Because when I'm 10 to 20 years older than she is, you know, she has to feel good about this thing. And the only way to, around that, you know, is, is to work on this and perhaps STEM exercises or, or forgiveness exercises as per hey or, or whatever else. I'm going to post this and see what comes back. The second video is, as he described it in the caption, an overview of my pad. It is John holding a camera, walking around his house, and giving the viewers a video tour of his home. This video lasts just over four minutes long. This is a two-bedroom brick ranch, conveniently located. Inside, okay. Here's my big screen TV. 32 inch. It's my computer. Computer is connected to the stereo, which I listen to my MP3s and everything else. Pan to the other side. Speakers on each side are large, they double as end tables. <laughs> okay, couch and chair, they match. The woman will be really be impressed. Little hallway, two bedrooms. Two bedrooms. To the right is my bedroom. Extra computer here, they're networked. I'll show you the Cat5 connections downstairs. Okay, there's, it looks pretty clean. I'm sure she'll be impressed. Now this back bedroom I use just for storage. There's a lot of junk here. 
you know, as we could see, uh, bottles of cologne and spare change and shoebox full of old pictures and photographs and stuff and come over here and there's CDs and all kinds of electronic gear I've bought since joining the list, tapes and so on. Each video has well over 100,000 views, but this is probably due to the disturbing fame he received from the shooting. While investigators were looking into John's online blog, they discovered that this isn't the first time John thought about conducting a mass attack. John decided January 6, 2009 was going to be the day of the attack. Listen to the following blog excerpt as to what transpired. January 6, 2009. I can do this. Leaving work today, I felt like a zombie, just going through the motions. Get on the bus, get in the car, drive home. My mind is screwed up anymore. I can't concentrate at work or think at all. This log is not detailed. It is only for confidence to do this. The future holds even less than what I have today. It is 6.40 p.m., an hour and a half to go. God have mercy. I wish life could be better for all and this crazy world can somehow run smoother. I wish I had answers. Bye. It is 8.45 p.m. I chickened out. Shit! I brought the loaded gun and everything. Hell! The police received a message from John's pastor not long after the shooting. The pastor had discovered that his full name, address, and phone number was listed on John's blog. John wrote in his blog that this pastor had convinced John that you can commit mass murder and still go to heaven. He then blogged on, encouraging readers to contact the pastor and ask him about this. John continued saying that he attended the Pittsburgh church due to guilt and fear for 13 years. He quit going to church in November of 2006. One of John's neighbors, Patricia, would later find out that he wrote about her college-aged daughter in his blog. John explained in explicit detail how much he enjoyed looking at Patricia's daughter from his house. Patricia said that he seemed like a semi-normal guy. He wasn't very social, but would say hello to them, and otherwise, he kept to himself. Understandably, Patricia and her fiancé were shocked to hear the news, not only about what John had done, but what he had written about Patricia's daughter. Really devastating, um, just knowing that, <clears throat> that he was uh, doing the things that he did, and the journal he was keeping, and um, the, just that he was, you know, going out for young girls, and Knowing what he said on July 23rd about my daughter, um, it's just so devastating to, to know that somebody like that lived right across the street from you. He wrote about your daughter in his journal. Uh, in one of the entries, um, he, he mentions your fiancé by name. He writes, I just looked out my front window and saw a beautiful college-age girl leave Bob Fox's house across the street. Uh, she was long-haired, hot little hottie with a beautiful bod. I, I won't continue because it is just disgusting. Um, it's, it's just so overwhelming. Um, just, not, just the idea of somebody like that, um, thinking like that. Um, for a young girl, I mean, my daughter is, is a college student, and uh, you know, just to think that if I would lose somebody like that, I don't know what I would do. Um, it's just so devastating. What, what was he so, like? Was there any indication that he was a disturbed individual? No. He, uh, he seemed pretty um, focused on life. He, he seemed happy. Um, I felt like he was just a, a loner who, who uh, liked to keep to himself. Um, he would say hi on occasion and uh, just, just never thought that somebody like that would would be so capable of, of what he's done. Um, well, Monday, uh, my fiancé and I talked to him briefly. Um, my fiancé had surgery, and he was asking about the surgery and um, saying that he was happy that he's doing well, and he seemed very concerned, and uh, like he was a just trusty, worthy, nice kind of guy that you could trust. I would have left him in my house any time, and, you know... Just the fear now, knowing what he did. Um, it's just that you can't trust anybody these days. It's just so devastating and, and just so hard to, to take in. It's just awful. It's just terrible. 
About one week before the shooting, on July 27th, 2009, at around 7 a.m., John had contact with the police because a person reported seeing a man on the public bus handling what looked like a grenade. The eyewitness reported he had seen a man come onto the bus, take a seat, and pull what looked to be a grenade out of a computer-type bag. The man then proceeded to play with the grenade. The witness was shown a picture of John, and while the man with the grenade looked very similar to the man in the picture, the witness could not be 100% certain they were one of the same. The police spoke with John and asked him if he was the person on the bus with what appeared to be a grenade. Of course, John denied that he had done such a thing. The witness also said he couldn't be sure that the grenade was real. However, it appeared authentic. Because the witness was not able to identify the man or even say if the grenade was real, coupled with John denying the claims, no charges were filed against John. John had left over $225,000 to his alma mater, the University of Pennsylvania. However, the school had no interest in collecting the money. In addition to his estate, which was valued at $225,000, his home was worth $75,000. Numerous victims sued John's estate for their injuries as well as pain and suffering. At one point, there were 21 different lawsuits pending that involved the victims suing John's estate or the LA Fitness Gym. The instructor that we mentioned at the beginning of the episode, Mary Primus, sued John's estate for $175,000. Her husband, Alex, also listed as a plaintiff. They sued on seven different counts including battery, stress, and harm while pregnant, which could result in a possible miscarriage, post-traumatic stress disorder, and emotional mental ailments. She was 26 years old and 10 weeks pregnant. Mary was shot twice in the shoulder and had to spend seven days in the hospital because of her injuries. Thankfully, her baby wasn't injured or harmed in any way as a result of the shooting. Miraculously, Mary gave birth to a perfectly healthy little boy in March of 2010, who she named Oliver. I was on the floor face down, so I didn't see a whole lot of it. So when I did finally look up, it was, um, it was very scary. There was a lot of chaos. That night, I actually announced to my class that I was pregnant, and it was actually supposed to be my last night for a little while. I was going to back off. Around quarter after eight, um, the lights went out, and seconds later, I started to hear what it sounded like a popping sound to me. Um, and I didn't know what it was. There were women screaming, people were running. I thought maybe the lights were exploding because I didn't recognize the sound. So I hit the floor because everybody else did. And um, it must have been seconds later I, I was shot for the first time. And that's when I realized what was happening. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't until I, I felt the first bullet and I realized what was happening. Um, and then I felt the second one. But I remember everything like it was yesterday. This can't be real. It felt like a scene from a movie. It was the first thing I thought about. The first thing I thought about was, was him and um, how it would affect my pregnancy. You know, every mother has a, a special bond with their children, but I think, at least in my, in my heart, we have an even more special bond because of what we went through together. I think that when you go through something that is uh, tragic or traumatic, um, you can learn from it in the end, and it just becomes, you know, part of who you are. To be able to show him, you know, how fantastic he is. During the investigation, it was no secret that John was experiencing severe sexual frustration. The two days prior to the shooting, John took off of work so he could practice his routine and memorize exactly what he planned to do on August 4th, 2009. August 3rd, 2009. I took today off, Monday, and tomorrow to practice my route and make sure it is well polished. I need to work out every detail. There's only one shot. Also, I need to be completely immersed into something before I can be successful. Haven't had a drink since Friday at about 2.30. Total effort needed. Tomorrow is the big day. His obvious downward spiral didn't raise the eyebrows of anyone around him. But then again, he didn't really have anyone around that would have noticed his behavior anyways. He didn't have any contact with his family members, nor did he have any friends. Be sure that if you have friends, or even acquaintances, that you notice have become more withdrawn, make sure to check up on them and let them know you care. That does it for today's episode of Active Shooter. Please remember, if you see something, say something. Thank you for listening, and we'll be back in two weeks. A huge shout out to Nate from Journey Into Comics Network podcast for reading John's online excerpts for us. You can check them out at www.journeyintocomics.com or on all major podcasting platforms by searching Journey Into Comics Network. 
Hey friendos, my name is Danny B and I host Retrostalgia. It's a critical analysis of every book.